So I'm joined on Skype right now by Dr. Alex Kumar, who is currently the medical doctor at the Concordia Research Station in Antarctica. He's conducting research for the European Space Agency to help understand how far human bodies and minds can be pushed towards a future manned mission to Mars. Alex, hello. Hello, how are you going? Good, yeah, yeah. how's the weather? Uh, minus 76 degrees Celsius today. I can, uh, I can pull it up for you and show you some of the trends. One moment. Uh, here we go. Let me show you. Here, I hope you can see. That's the minus 74.3. We've got an increase by two degrees. Lucky us. Wow, you must be. Those, those little increases must be very important to you, living in those conditions. Absolutely, yeah. Every, every degree counts. <laughs> Alex, as you know, I'm on a mission this weekend to hack my way into space and I'm asking some experts for their advice. Now, you are currently living, as you've just shown, in one of the most isolated, extreme environments on Earth. There are no natural resources other than ice and temperatures that are falling to even lower than you've just described, to minus 80 degrees Celsius. Now, this is the closest that anyone on Earth can come to living on the surface of another planet. What are the most challenging elements of living in such an extreme environment? Well, uh, obviously the isolation comes first. I mean, we're, we're away from friends, family, McDonald's happy meals and life as you know it. It's, it really is life on planet Concordia. I'm living at Concordia Station. It's a French-Italian station. It's located at around 3,800 meters equivalent altitude. So we suffer from low oxygen level along with the isolation. We're about in a couple of weeks' time to enter into the world's harshest winter the world has to offer, the Antarctic winter, and temperatures will drop below minus 80 degrees Celsius. Not that it makes much difference below minus 20 for me, but there you have it. And on top of that, we have four months of complete darkness. We'll kiss goodbye to the sun uh, on around the, around the start the beginning of May. Uh, we won't see it again rise on a horizon until around August. So, I mean, if it was life on the other planet, it would be life without the sun, maybe the dark side of the moon. But certainly this is the most extreme environment, yes. So this is good preparation for you to learn and understand what it might be like to go to the extreme environment of space uh, or another planet. Um, what's the focus of your Absolutely. research so far? I mean, what well, it, have you learned from that research that you're doing? Well, it's interesting uh, research. It's, it's a lot of experiments rolled into one protocol, of which I'm testing my crew members and myself. Uh, most of the results won't be processed until home, but I can tell you what we found in the previous years, as well as already being here. I mean, um, your sleep light cycle uh, that you would have in England, your circadian rhythm <clears throat> changes for fir first things. <clears throat> Second thing is your immune system drops, so you're more susceptible to infections, and yet in this environment, we're protected because we only have certain bacteria that can live here, and we bring whatever bacteria we have with us, so it's known as a closed environment. But more important, we, we've shown that humans can survive in such extreme environments. It's not natural. There's no indigenous or aboriginal community here, though there are communities undergoing the same processes, uh, though not as severe, in the Arctic, so towards the North Pole as opposed to down here in Antarctica. But between us and the South Pole Station and a few of the British stations dotted around, as well as the other international stations, there's probably only around one, 150 people overwintering in Antarctica total. So it's fascinating. And with that comes uh, a variety of research. But I hope, to, I hope that this shows that we can make it to Mars one day. 
Uh, it's a matter of logistics, of course. Um, a communication like this between myself and you back on Earth, if I was on the surface of Mars, would have a 20-minute delay, which you can imagine is uh, incredible, really, to try and hold a conversation. So there are a lot of challenges, but we're slowly understanding those challenges and finding ways to overcome them, as well as understanding that we can flex human physiology and psychology to these limits and past these limits. It's amazing. And that thing about the communication as well. I mean, I am talking to you from the UK whilst you're in Antarctica by video and on Skype. So as we know, the technology is there to help us to do that. And what I'm hearing from you is that we as human beings are already incredibly resourceful and adaptive organisms that will be able to go those distances. Yep, absolutely. This is good absolutely. news. Absolutely. This is good news for me, considering that I am going to space tomorrow. Um, now, you mentioned that you uh, you're going to be spending winter in Antarctica. There, this is uh, you're going to be the only doctor at the Concordia sure. Station, um, with, as I understand it, no other humans that are able to reach you for eight months. Now, that is a great responsibility. How are you feeling about that? Well, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult. You know, the isolation and the eight months, you hope nothing happens. You can't promise anyone that nothing will happen, and you have to live by it. That's a dogma we come to Antarctica under, really, and the, the same dogma everyone overwinters here. Um, you, you come on the understanding that it is the most extreme environment. Anything can happen, but I'm lucky to be well supported. I, I work for the French Polar Institute, so I have French doctors on call 24 hours. I work with the Italian Antarctic program as well, so I have further more Italian service. But more, more important to me, I suppose, in terms of the language barriers and uh, medicine as I know it, as it's very culturally different, um, yet we're all human beings, is that the British Antarctic Survey Medical Unit has adopted me as well. And so far, through the minor processes that have gone on and the minor ailments and diseases we've had to deal with, um, it's, it's been incredible. So uh, on the one hand, yes, I, I am alone. But on the other, I feel well supported. And uh, that feeling of alone really goes away. Well, I'm really heartened to hear that because I, I'm feeling pretty nervous about my trip into space tomorrow for some of those reasons. You know, it is... It is a dangerous mission. I understand that. And I will be a long way from home. I, I'm pretty sure that I am going to miss my family quite a lot. And I hope that they will miss me. Um, what is the advice, listening to you just now, I mean, what advice do you have for me or other people that might be going into space to manage those feelings? Well, it's difficult, you know. You're not going to be uh, able to go out with friends to the cinema, to out to the bars and uh, various things. You're not going to be able to see your family's birthdays go past or nephews and nieces beginning to talk. It's, uh, it's a challenge, you know. I've, I've spent a long time in my life. I'm only 28 years old, about to turn 29 here, actually. So there's my birthday going to be spent uh, down here with a crew of European and Italians, so, is, who are now my friends. When is your birthday, but, uh, uh, 31st of May. The 31st of May. I will make sure to, well, maybe not send you a card because it won't guarantee getting there, but something. We'll do something 31st of May. Sorry, I interrupted you. But, uh, no, no, of course. You know, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's very challenging. I've spent a lot of time on the road in my life. I've spent six months living in the Arctic. Um, you know, you miss things in life. You miss the smell of cut grass. I was freshly cut grass. You're approaching the summer back in the UK. And of course, from space, as of tomorrow, you'll be observing all the world's daylight-night processes and summer and winter in different hemispheres just by looking up and down, really. So it's, uh, it's certainly a challenge. But even David Livingston, when he, went, when he died in Africa, the Africans kept his heart and sent his body back to be buried in the UK. So I think home is where the heart is. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm not going to encounter any extraterrestrials up there that, that might want a piece of me like that. But I hope they send it back if they do. I mean, we're talking about going to space here. And you've, you've had an extraordinary career, even in you know, a short period of time already. Would you like to go to space or do you hope to go to space? Yes, please. When's, the, when's your next flight? <laughs> well, let me get this one. Let me sort out how I'm doing it this time. And the next time... 
if you're anywhere close to where I am for the launch, I'd definitely have you on board. Um, yeah. I suppose this thing, I want to go to space, you want to go to space. A lot of our young agents talk about how they would love to go to space and to be astronauts as well. But an interesting part of this, in, in my role as the Director of Human Spaceflight Operations at Unlimited Space Agency, I'm often asked why. Why do I want to do that? I mean, at a time when there is already so much that we need to achieve on the Earth to improve life here, what would be the benefit of me going into space? What benefit is there to me leaving the planet at this time? Well, it's a very interesting question. I'd love to ask uh, Andre Coupiers, who's the ESA sponsored astronaut circling our Earth 20, 20 or so thousand kilometers above us now on the International Space Station, of what he sees and how his perspective changes. Certainly, I was lucky enough to go to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida when I was a kid. And I took one, only one object home, along with the space ice cream, I have to say, which was, which was brilliant. But I took one object home from there, which I bought from the shop, which is a picture of our planet from, taken from the surface of the moon. And that really caught my imagination and led me to all the countries and all the explorations I've done over the last 10 years off, off, on my own, sort of off my own back. But uh, I think, you know, going into space is unique certainly it's uh it's a challenge it, we've overcome that challenge if you were to look at the successes of the past century going into space and setting foot on the moon would is certainly the one that makes the top well you know for some people top 10 but for me certainly the top achievement of mankind um you know just today in the news and over the last few days I, i've been reading the ESA website and uh, I don't know if you managed to catch the story about penguins from space, that using the technology that's available today, they were able to estimate the numbers of emperor penguins, obviously an endangered species by climate change. Um, they were able to find out that actually double the population existed. So who'd have thought that would be possible? The contributions to science from space is incredible. I mean, uh, and... Not only you know, is it a contribution to research and science, but it's also furthering mankind. It's the death on the ice here, you know, on its way back, foot on the moon. We've achieved uh, that Arthur Conan Doyle lost world. And here I am trying to help, help push humans towards Mars. So for me, it's all about how far and how wide you can go. But humankind has a long way to go, certainly. I agree with you. There is an awful lot that we need to achieve as a human race to make things better. And I love love that people like you are doing what you're doing in order to help us do that and doing it for the penguins as well um now given your experience i'm just gonna uh, you're cutting out a little bit so i'll let you know if it gets too bad but um you know given that you're calling from antarctica this is an internet connection that's to be expected um now given your experience and the fact that i am aiming to travel to space tomorrow i mean really I've got 25 hours to prepare for this. What are the most important preparations that you think I should be focusing on? One person. Call Loredana Bessoni at the ESA. She does some psychological training. Uh, I have to say she trained us to come down here, and it was blooming good training. So uh, with only those 24 or so hours left, I would get in touch with her. This this is great news because I am speaking to Loredana later today about uh, 1,600 hours GMT. Um, what do I need to ask her? I mean, I have some things that I want to ask her. What do I need to make sure I ask Loredana? Are you bad enough to go into space? I <laughs> asked the same question to come down here. and She guaranteed me I was crazy enough. That made me feel very reassured. <laughs> I'm going to be so reassured if I am certified later today to go to space. Um, now, that's the advice for me, you know, at the stage that I am now. Uh, what about for our young agents that are thinking that they want to go into space or maybe do a job like the job that you're doing? What advice do you have for them to achieve similarly brilliant things? Never stop dreaming. Uh, there'll be always people in interviews, people on the street, people on television, people on the radio, people around you, even your family sometimes and friends that may, you know, say that your dreams aren't attainable. Never stop dreaming and never stop believing in your dreams because it's dreams that have pushed mankind as far as we've gone. 
whether it be through the interior of Africa like Livingston or out in, into outer space like Neil Armstrong and onto the surface of the moon. So uh, I'd say hold those dreams true and try, and try and stick to them as best as you can. That's a very beautiful piece of advice, Alex. Thank you. And one that I really echo from my experience in life as well. Um, now, you've done that. You've pursued those dreams. You have traveled and worked as a doctor across the world in so many different places. And the conversation that we're having now, do you think of yourself as an explorer or an adventurer or a scientist or all of the above? Well, you know, uh, working in the John Radcliffe Hospital emergency department in, in, back in the UK before I came away, People will question whether I'm a doctor with the amount of time I spend exploring and adventuring ar around the world and abroad. So uh, sometimes I question whether or not I'm even a doctor. But certainly I put uh, my exploration and interest and curiosity for the natural world, not only the natural world, but the different cultures that exist around the world. I've never had a better day spent than with the Inuit out on the ice in the Arctic or with a tribe in the Amazon, the Yanomami. So uh, I have to say all, all of those rolled into one and I have to stress the importance of not just being a doctor or not just being an explorer but more so combining all the natural sciences in this day and age it's difficult to retain a generalist and you know point of view to life and an interest in all the natural sciences as Sir David Attenborough may have for example and it's there's a big difference between knowledge and experience. Standing in the Sistine Chapel is very different to reading about standing in the Sistine Chapel. And with that, you can learn things from science with a perspective of exploration and vice versa. You can only find a species of bacteria if you to go deep into a cave in Venezuela and and swab those cave walls, as we did just back in April. So it's uh, it's really all of those things in one. A bit like Dr. Wilson, Edward Wilson, the first doctor to the South Pole, who unfortunately passed away alongside Scott. But he was there dissecting penguins, going out on the worst journey of the world to collect emperor penguin eggs to both sort of uh, confirm the, the uh, theory of evolution. And uh, also, he obviously went to the South Pole and searched what lay there. So I'd say all of those things in one, and it's a benefit to others as well as yourself to be all of those things. Alex, that's a, that's a very beautiful piece of advice. Um, thank you for your time today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure understanding better what it is that you're doing. I think this is going to be very useful to me. I'm very excited about speaking to Loredana later today as well. I am definitely going to keep this dream today because it is making me nervous. I am scared and worried. I'm not sure how I'm going to do it, but I think I'm going to remember this conversation with you and pursue that as, as far as I can and do this as well as I can. Um, if any, for any of you that are watching this conversation between Alex and me, you must follow Alex on his blog. It's uh, www.alexanderkumar.com. He's writing an amazing account of what he's doing down in Antarctica there at Concordia. Some beautiful pictures as well and bedtime stories as well, which I am really enjoying. Um, Alex, any final words for me or for any of our agents? Well, hold on tight, enjoy the ride. Um, I hope that space food or rehydrated space food is as good as the food we eat here on planet Concordia. And uh, I'll let you know when I'm back on Earth. Excellent. I'm going to take you out for that happy meal. <laughs> enjoy your trip and my best to uh, Lloyd. I do confirm that I'm still... Crazy. <laughs> I will tell her that you are still crazy. Alex, thank you very, very much. Be safe out there. Thank you. Good luck for tomorrow. Best of luck. Thank you. Godspeed. <laughs> <laughs>